Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grant, and I'm the MC for today's University Speakers Conference on Personal Finance and Investing. We'll begin shortly. We want to make sure we allow a couple minutes for those who are still joining us. In the meantime, please let us know what part of the country you're in and which university you go to or where you graduated from via the chat box. We would love to see where you're all from and where you're at today. And before we bring in our first conference speaker, I want to quickly introduce University Speakers. University Speakers brings experts from a variety of different fields to share their knowledge with young adults. Conference topics are wide ranging with the commonality being that they are extremely essential topics for young adults to have more of an understanding of then what may be taught to about them with the university classrooms. Some examples of topics covered in university speakers conferences are acing job and internship interviews, mental health for students, nutrition while at the university, resources for student entrepreneurs, and of course, today's topic, which is personal finance and investing for young adults. And thank you all for those of you that are putting your information in. That's great to see. While I now I would like to welcome our first speaker of the day, Fares Quadri. Fares is a digital entrepreneur and a TikTok star known for posting life hacks, comedy videos, wealth building advice, and content describing different ways to make money online and offline. Fares is also a finance graduate from the University of Illinois Chicago and is working at the law firm Kirkland & Ellis, which is the largest law firm in the world by revenue. While you listen to Farez speak, please also ask your own questions to him by commenting on the story posted in his, Farez's social media links in the description below. And we'll choose one question for him to answer live, and the rest of the questions will be replied to on that story. So, hi, Ferez. Can you tell us about your story and how you started on social media? Hey, Grant. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's a pleasure being here, and thank you for everyone listening. So, um, my story, pretty much everyone knows, hopefully knows what TikTok is by now. It's probably the large, it is actually the largest growing social media platform, and it's taking the world by storm. Um, but my story starting is actually kind of funny, I would say. So this was during COVID time, um, you know, everyone was just staying home and couldn't do anything. So me and a couple of my friends actually were like, you know, we're not doing anything. And we saw how big TikTok was getting. So we're like, hey, let's do a little competition. Whoever can get the most followers in 30 days when, you know, the pandemic is over, we'll treat them to, uh, you know, lunch or whatever. So me being competitive, I didn't want to lose. So we both, we all had our own niche. Mine was personal finance because that's something I was always interested in. So I just started making videos about personal finance and a couple of videos actually took off and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then they ended up not doing so well and they got like frustrated because their videos weren't doing well. Uh, but me, I just like fell in love with it. And then from then on, I just started becoming more consistent. This was like something I really enjoyed it. Then I moved over to YouTube and other social media platforms. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my story of how I started TikTok. And like I said, I've always been interested in personal finance. Um, it's something that from high school, I've always been interested in entrepreneurship, money, and I've always just been learning on my own through YouTube and um, joining other courses and live streams that as people are doing today. Fascinating. So I'm sure the biggest question everybody wants to know is, what can someone's earning potential be if they wanted to start out on social media? <laughs> that is a very good question. And the thing is, the best way to say it is there's no limit, I would say, um, because that, that's one of the main reasons why I love content creation is there's no cap as to how much you can make. Um, is there's an unlimited amount of people that will view your stuff and an unlimited amount of um, ways you can make money when you have viewership. So um, I wish I can give like a exact number, but the best thing I can say is there's no <laughs> exact number. So um, if you're what I can say right now is for TikTok, if you're at about 100,000 um, followers, you could probably get, I would say, about thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per brand deal um this is specifically in my niche and uh, i presume a lot of people watching this is are interested in personal finance and money so it kind of resonates but because our 
rates are so much higher because, um, you know, personal finance has to do with money. And um, a lot of people are willing to pay a lot of money to for us to see their ads. Um, our CPMs are higher. So for those of you interested in personal finance, um, I would say start making content if you can, because it's probably one of the best ways to make money right now um, that a lot of people aren't talking about. It takes a lot to get started and it's not as easy as everyone makes it out to seem, but it can be very, very rewarding in the long term. Cool. So I got a, a question that's not on my list. How long did it take you to get to a hundred thousand? Took me about a year. So it took me a full year of grinding. I didn't get paid anything. I was just, I just really enjoyed it. And I, at that point, I didn't even know you can make money on TikTok. I was just doing my own thing. I was just posting, posting. And then after that one year, a couple of videos did really well. And then I found like my thing. And then from then on, it was like, exponential growth now i'm sitting at close to 2 million followers um and things just took off but that first year was like like so slow. it was like a snail walking but um that that's one of that taught me a lot actually about consistency and things don't come overnight how a lot of people make out to seem you know things take time and dedication and I'm, I'm happy for that i'm happy i didn't grow right away i'm happy i got to see the slow steady growth Good for you. That's really cool. So what advice, let's switch to investing a little bit. What advice do you have for the viewers regarding investing for the future? So I think the best thing is to take action. See, like when I was in college and high school, um, everyone always talks about investing. You're like, oh yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it when uh, I have money, when I graduate college, when I do this. But the thing is you need to take action now because if you keep doing that, when you get to that level of graduating or when you start making real money, you're going to come up with another excuse to be like, hey, I'll just wait until then or I'll just wait until this happens. And you just keep going longer and longer and longer. So my biggest advice is just take action. Um, I live by this saying. It's called um, ready, fire, aim. It's you have an idea, you have something you go, you, you shoot for it. And then you steer which way you want to go. What a lot of people do is, and the standard is ready, aim, fire. You know, you have idea, you do your research, you look, you know, you plan it out and then you go for it. Um, I think the best way for a lot of people is you have an idea and you go for it right away. So you eliminate that overthinking process. You go straight into it. And then, yes, you might make mistakes, but the learning aspect is a lot. You get to learn from that. And sometimes that's more valuable than the outcome. Great. I think social media is in some ways like that is uh, forgiving for allowing people to retry stuff. So what we would like you to do now is pick one of the questions from the audience's questions on your social media and answer it for us, if you would. Sure. Let me go through my social media real quick. Pick a tough one. <laughs> uh, let's see. If there's any in the chat box, people have questions, let me know as well. I can go through those as well. Um, okay, I think this one is a really good one that I saw. Um, someone asked, how what, how much money do I make from social media and everything I do? Um, I wish I could give an exact number, but it's, it's crazy for me to say, but it's over six figures. And there's been months where I've been very close to making six figures in just one month, just from... Um, specifically i would say social media so um hopefully that gives like some from you guys some framework of the amount of money that can make and one thing i learned from all this is we're, we're limited to our thinking like we think you know a 50 80 100 000, 120 000, like it's a good salary cap but it's not there's so much money out there in the world that we think oh we'll never get to that level but it's just crazy to think that anyone can get to that level there's no amount of little money there's there's i can't even explain how much money is out there and if you guys watch videos you'll know people are willing to dish out anything um for if you have the proper skill set cool we had an interesting uh question here in this in the social in the chat box what helped you with your self-belief to break through to new heights on your success was there any one thing or a combination would you have i think the biggest thing was i just knew i could do a lot more i i, I didn't want to do the, do the, you know, the nine to five. And I, I know it's not a bad thing. And that's something I really was willing to do. And I was happy for it. But in the back of my mind, I knew I just wanted to do something um, 
unique, something I, I want to have my own business, some my investing dividend income, something that's like supporting my lifestyle. So just having that in the back of my mind, hey, I need to be doing something. I can't, you know, just sit around and rely on this. I need to try new things, learn new things. Um, so just having that in the back of my mind, I think helped me propel myself to to new heights. Staying focused, it sounds like on the on the yeah. end goal. So I'm going to be honest. I'm I'm a non TikToker, and every time I want to get started on it, it's just like, oh, I got to go make stupid videos. Is are there regular channels, or are they all silly, or is that what grabs audience? Yeah, what that, kind of a mix what, do you do? It's for me, it's all personal finance. So I break down large concepts. So whether it is 401k, investing, dividends, um, just real life money stuff, I break it down to like where a baby can understand it. And I don't just give it, I try to make it like comedy oriented. So I like to, I, I make it into skits. So um, like if I'm talking about like a bank, like I'll be a banker and like I'll be myself, like talking to a banker. Like I'll make like funny skits where, you know, people it's enjoyable and people get a learn out of it. So um there's a lot of different ways you can start. Um, and the cool thing that I learned now that TikTok has grown so much in the past couple of years is there's a lot of sub niches within it. So um, you might think, oh, no one is interested in this. But the way the algorithm works, they'll show your videos to people who are. And then you'll be like, wow, I didn't know these many people were interested. Um, so this goes back to the thing where I talked about action just goes a long way because you'll never know until you actually take action and then you can maneuver hey this isn't working let me do this instead of worrying about all that beforehand before you even post a video you know so do you try to mix your tiktok with like instagram or other channels or is that your big thing and that's where you really focus so tiktok is where i come up with new content and i post new videos what I do is I repurpose those videos onto my Instagram um, and other social media platforms. Um, I, I think short form is a new new wave right now. A lot of people are into short form and it's a good thing and a bad thing because a lot of people's attention spans have come down a lot because of TikTok. Um, so you're, you're going to start to see a lot of people are not watching these long movies or long YouTube videos because TikTok has, I would say, kind of ruined it for them. So that's why you see Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, all these other social medias grappling onto the short form content. So what I'm doing is making new content on TikTok and then repurposing it onto these other social media platforms because I'm making this video. So why not just, you know, repurpose it as much in the uh, in other social medias because you can never have too much content. Whereas YouTube, I'm still putting on long, long form content. I have, um, I still think YouTube is a long term way to go because YouTube is YouTube. It's it never died and it's, I don't think it ever will. Um, but YouTube is a different type of video you have to make. The audience is completely different than um, these other social medias. Hmm. Any advice on hashtags? Um, see, there's a lot of stories. Those... You know, put in 30, put in two, put in five. What, what, what works? Yeah. So, what I learned is, so what I do personally for mine is, Four to five, I keep hashtags on mine specifically related to the video. Now, there's a lot of people that say keep it broad, keep it specific. For me, I like to keep it specifically to the video. Um, the thing is, at the end of the day, hashtags might or may not what matter, and we never will know because that has to do with algorithm. But at the end of the day, what matters is your content. How engaging is your content? How informative is your content? Because if if your content like checks all the boxes in terms of someone's like viewership. The algorithm doesn't matter. I mean, the algorithm doesn't matter, but like hashtags don't really matter because as long as the watch time is there, as long as people are rewatching it, they're going to push out your video no matter what algorithm because their end goal is to keep as many people on the apps. So hashtags matter maybe a little bit. Maybe they don't. No one really knows. But at the end of the day, it's your content that matters the most. That's what I've learned over the past couple of years. Well, that certainly makes sense. That is for sure. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your inspiring story and valuable information with us. It's, it's been fascinating. I keep thinking of uh, questions I can ask, like how many hours a day? Let's ask it. How many hours a day do you spend making videos? So honestly, you, when I first started out, it probably took me like an hour. I would be scripted, filmed and edited. But as I've grown, now, for one video, I probably put in at least six to seven hours for one TikTok in terms of scripting, um, filming, and editing. Um, a lot goes into it. Like, you think on TikTok or any content creation, it's very quick. You know, you have an idea, you post it, and then it's, it's done. But there's so much that goes on behind the scene, and it's, like, a pretty much a full-time job. Like, um, 
you can easily put in hours on hours uh, in terms of content. And YouTube is a whole nother game. YouTube, you can easily put in like 10 to 20 hours on just one single video. Um, so it's, it's a time commitment. But in the long term, if you're trying to grow a personal brand, just grow something. I think personal brand is the best way to go, especially in today's um, day and age. Cool. I'm going to loop that to, you know, do something back to the financial thing. Uh, since this is a lot of uh, investing, what do people need to start to invest? Is it 20 bucks? Is it 200? Is it 2000? What, what can they start investing with so we can get our students involved in that? Yeah. I, the thing is, people think you need a lot. And what I've learned is you really don't. You just need, when it goes back to action, you just need to take action. There's a lot of apps out there that they, you can start with fractional investing. I don't know if a lot of people have learned that, but you can buy fractions of a share, as little as $1, and use that $1. And I say, start with whatever you're comfortable with. My biggest thing is only invest what you can afford to. So if it's $1, it's $1. If it's $0.25, cents, it's $0.25. Cents. Just put it in. That way you can learn how everything works. You can Once you have money into something, it's your you know something you worked hard for. So you'll learn. You'll try to uh, do things because it's your money. So honestly the more the better obviously in the long term for investments but to start out you can start out with anything um a lot of people are afraid of oh i have to i need this much or that much but the biggest thing is starting because once you start the extra amount will come in because you'll feel more confident and you don't need to know a whole lot to start investing no because it goes back personally for me and what i like to tell people is not really because if you do start to learn everything, then you're just gonna fall into that big cycle of always wanting to learn, learn, and never want to, never wanting to actually start because you're gonna be afraid. I don't know enough. So mm -hmm. I would say learn enough as you can. And uh, if you're watching this, um, I guarantee you, you know enough about investing where um, you can start actually right now, and then you'll learn as you go. Cool. Well, thanks again for us. We uh, really appreciate your inspiring story. And man, what great information. We really appreciate that. One of the key takeaways, I believe, is you don't need to be a financial genius to start investing. And you need to understand the basics and learn from there on towards building your own financial nest egg. Speaking of which, today's conference partner app, Revolut, provides the easiest way for you to do this. And now it's time to show you how you can claim your $20 cash credit via Revolut and the $100 training course that will teach you the basics. And in case you have not already registered with Revolut, using the link that we'll share in the description below the live stream, you can do so now. And this video will show you how to register and claim the $20 sign-in bonus, which you can either invest via the app or spend on whatever you want. Since we're talking about investing, hmm. <laughs> for those of you that don't already know Revolut, it's Europe's free financial super app with around 20 million users across Europe that has been very recently launched in the US. Think of Venmo, Robinhood, Coinbase, PayPal, and Cash App all in the same app with some extra features too. Some of the things you can do via Revolut is send money to friends and family and others not only when within the U.S. like Venmo, but also internationally across currencies, just like PayPal, but without any currency conversion fees. Moreover, just like Robinhood and Coinbase, you can invest in stocks and crypto without any fees via Revolut. Revolut has the great sign-up offer for those attending today's conference, which can be claimed by completing the registration process using the link in the description and doing at least one transaction with the Revolut card of any amount, even as little as a dollar. Please note that this offer is only valid for U.S. users and can only be claimed by using the link in the description. So this is really important. If you go to the App Store and download Revolut directly, you will not be able to get the $20 to spend or invest. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Hayes, and I'm streaming from California. I'm going to now show you the steps on how to claim the $20 reward and get access to your financial trading course worth $100. It takes five to 10 minutes, and I will do everything while sharing my phone screen so you can all follow along. 
At the conference, you also learn how to use Revolut for trading stocks and crypto. Of course, the best thing about Revolut is that it's a free app with zero commission trading fees. If everyone has their phone ready, I'll start with the steps and you just need to follow along. Please, moderators, share the link with the audience. It should be pinned at the top of the live chat or similar. I'll wait just five seconds for everyone to find and click this link. On the landing page that opens, I will enter my phone number here to receive the special promo link for conference attendees, which will give me $20 in cash as a sign-up bonus. Moderators, please censor the phone number while streaming. Okay, here we go. And now I should receive a text message with the app install link. Here it is. Please note that you need to use your personal link in the SMS to download Revolut from the App Store. This is very important as otherwise you will not receive the $20 sign-up bonus. Okay, now the download is finished and I can open the app. Everyone has received their download link via SMS. I'll just wait another 10 seconds or so to let everyone get to this point. Let's get started. What you will see is the fastest way you ever sign up a bank account. Well, I have to enter the same phone number I gave the URL to claim the $20 bonus. I enter the six digit verification code. I enable push notifications to not miss optimal moments to invest. United States is already pre-selected as a country of residence. And by the way, you need to select USA to receive the $20 as we've managed to secure this special promotion exclusively for our US based audience. All right, so now you accept the terms and conditions and what do they need? First of all, my home address. Please moderators blur that out again. First name, last name, click continue, date of birth, and here we go. Email, we are nearly done. It asked me to take a selfie. I need to allow camera access for that. Smile and done. I'd recommend allowing access to contacts as well because it makes sending money for free as easy as Venmo or PayPal, but even better since you can send and receive money for free internationally too, which isn't the case with Venmo or PayPal. Lastly, US citizens and residents will now enter their social security number. This is mandatory to receive the $20 sign up bonus and use the investing feature of the app. Let's move on to the next step. What do I want to use Revolut for? Revolut is basically like a Venmo plus PayPal plus Cash App plus Robinhood plus Coinbase all within the same app. With some extra features too, as you can see here on your screen. Let's use transfers for friends. Overseas transfer, stocks and crypto. And this is what we're going to show you today, but feel free to select as many as you want. Again, it's all zero fees with Revolut in the US. Also here for the plan, I'll choose free standard plan for now. And even with that plan, I get a free debit card delivered in a couple of days. But with a metal plan, you get a cool metal card and some other interesting perks and benefits too. Now, what do you guys need to do so your card arrives loaded with a $20 cash bonus? Very simple. The first time I make a transaction with my Revolut card or use Apple Pay or Google Pay, it instantly credits $20 bonus to my account. This can be a transaction of any amount to qualify for the signup bonus, which will be instantly credited to my Revolut account and can be spent on anything. And guess what? We have organized that you can use the card to buy the financial trading course at the nominal price of $1 by using your Revolut virtual card, which is just enough to activate your signup bonus. Okay, so let me do that. I'll just add $50 for now so you have some money later to show you some of the features as well, but any amount would do. $1, $20, $100, or $1,000 that you would then have the account to invest in stocks and cryptos without any fees at the same time so you can spend through your Revolut MasterCard and Visa debit cards. Please, moderators, blur out my details again while I finish the top up. And here it is. I added $50 and now we'll create a virtual Revolut debit card to claim the course and $20 reward. To create the virtual card, I click on the Cards tab. Click on Get Card and select Virtual Debit Card. That's it. With the Revolut debit card and the promo code, I can now go to the course checkout page and claim the course at $1 instead of the regular price of $100 or $99. Also, the $20 cash reward will be instantly credited to my Revolut account within minutes of making the $1 transaction. Now we go to the course page of the financial trading course for which you should find the link in the description below the live stream. And again, use the promo code Revolut at checkout. I have to click add to cart. Continue shopping. Click 
check out. After that, I have to register and then I can get to the checkout page to enter the promo code Revolut. And ta-da, price went down to $1. Now we will use our shiny new Revolut card at checkout. This will take a minute to fill everything out and then done. The course is mine. And now you can go back to my Revolut and there's a $20 reward created on my account. There it is. If you haven't received it yet, you can take a few minutes, but usually it's quite instant. I wish it was always this easy to make 20 bucks. All right, I'll let you finish out your Revolut setup so you can now have it ready in the next session with me when we do some first investments together. And you can follow along to learn how to do some of the coolest investing related features of the app. See you later in about 15 minutes after the speaker. Thank you so much for all that info. That's going to be fascinating. So in about 15 minutes, we'll show you some of the coolest features Revolut has, including how to easily buy stocks and crypto. So in case you've not already managed to get it set up, please make sure to set up the app using the link in the description by then. Now I have another very interesting thing to share with you. Besides the Revolut credit, free trading course and free access to all the university speakers conferences this next school year, University Speakers is also giving out additional $10,000 in scholarships. Now here's the information on how you can claim the additional scholarships. If you register for Revolut, your rev tag, which is your Revolut username, will be put into a monthly scholarship drawing with a prize of $1,000 each month. The drawings will be held at the end of each month, starting July 31st, with the fifth and last one being on November 30th. If you get Revolut right away and get your rev tag via email to conference at universityspeakers.org, that's conference at universityspeakers.org, you will not only be put into all five drawings, a total of $5,000 of scholarships are awarded this way. With an additional $5,000 in scholarships awarded to one of our conference attendees who does the most number of trades using the Revolut between now and the end of the year. And then on December 31st, $5,000 will be awarded to this conference attendee and both stock as well as crypto trades are considered when counting the number of total trades made. So there we go. That's some exciting stuff. Well, let's move on. And I want to introduce and welcome our next speaker, Gabriella, Gabriele Tringali, who is joining us all the way from Milan, Italy. And Gabriella, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. She studied finance and economics at one of Europe's elite universities, Bocconi University, as well as the University of Southern California. And following that, Gabriella has worked at a leading investment bank in London, as well as one of the world's leading asset management companies across both the UK and Italy. Please click in the link, please click her link in the description and post any questions that come up for Gabriella on the university speaker's Instagram post that opens up. And we'll choose one question for her to answer live. And then the rest of the questions will be replied to via replies on Instagram. Hi, Gabriella. Please choose one of the questions from the audience's questions on the social media to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Let me just check the, uh, the, the link and uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, let me just confirm the Instagram. And, and I may have jumped ahead. If you would like to go ahead with your presentation first, we can wait on that question if you'd like. Ah, perfect, perfect. And then yeah. I'll start right away. Uh, so, okay, today we'll uh, look at the personal finance and introduction in general to asset classes. So, uh, as, as we mentioned before, investing is quite important and is part of uh, uh, my personal life, but also my professional life. Um, so uh, if we move to the first slide, I want just to give you a first uh, uh, overview of what type of assets can be out there uh, and making a difference from physical assets and uh, financial assets. So physical assets is uh, an asset that has a value, it can be touched, it can be anything from a pen, 
to a mug, to everything, an uh, Apple Watch uh, or uh, whatever it is. Um, uh, while a financial asset is, uh, uh, is a different asset, which is bought in a form of a certificate. So it's sort of an agreement as a contract, uh, which of course has different benefit for the buyer, depending on the type. Um, today, we are going to go through, the, with the, starting from the next slide, uh, we're going to go through all the major asset classes. Of course, in 10 minutes, it's very complicated to have a comprehensive uh, uh, overview, but uh, um, uh, absolutely, uh, it's good to start uh, for you that you may probably are at the beginning of your investment career or you're, you're just interested in the personal finance. Um, starting from uh, equities uh, or stock, which is the first asset class and probably the uh, most known by everybody in the industry, but also from you. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So what is an equity? Equity holders uh, are owners, effectively, of companies. So when you buy a stock in a market, it can be the US stock market, but any market in, in the world, you are taking a portion uh, of that company and you uh, might have also a voting investing power, uh, as limited, of course, as, as the amount of, sh of share that you own. Why people invest in equity? Because there can be a price as heap appreciation. Let's say you buy a certain stock X at 100 today, it may go up to 102, 210 in the near future, and then you may sell for a profit, uh, but also you may receive something along the way. This something is called dividend. Dividend is sort of a reward that uh, a corporation gives you once uh, you invest in them and for the loyalty of, uh, of investing for the long term and bearing the risk of the company and pushing the company's uh, values and missions. Um, so the two main valuation uh, component of the equity side are the price and dividend that you receive. If you move to the next slide. There are, of course, uh, for every investment, it's just not for equity, advantages and uh, disadvantages for equity investing. Uh, the earnings, important profit sharing, which is the dividends, which I mentioned uh, to you before, and the returns in terms of capital appreciation, of course, are the reason why we invest. Uh, another advantage is that the equity market is quite liquid. Uh, as you mentioned before, there can be a lot of apps or exchanges where these are traded and are typically the most form of liquid investment that you might get. What are the disadvantages then? Of course, there is always a trade-off when it comes to investing. Um, the first uh, is there is an high risk uh, with no return guarantee. Today, the price is 100, but it may even fall to zero. There's nobody telling you how the price is going to go. Of course, you can learn uh, uh, models, evaluation, how you value a company, but uh, you don't have the crystal ball. So, of course, there is a risk coming through the reward. Of course, the higher the potential of the return, usually the higher the risk. So it's a correlated factor. And as you, you probably know from current market condition, there is a lot of volatility and you need to constant monitor. One day, one price may, can be as high as, as possible with the other day may fall uh, for for any any kind of reason let's move then to a different asset class so if we move to the next slide um, actually we finish with the equity investor profile who is typical an equity investor someone who has an higher risk appetite uh, as a long-term horizon they say stocks for the long term it means that if you buy a stock today typically it would be the best performing asset class among the traditional asset classes in the long term and you can start small you can start investing a few few dollars a few euros depending where you're from uh, and, and it's quite easy to access Let's move to the next slide. Now, another very, very well-known asset class are, is typically bonds. Bonds uh, is a safer, sort of safer asset class, and is an uh, asset class that generates a stream of interest payment where one party lends money to another. So basically you're giving some money to another person, another entity, another organization in order to uh, receive what is called an interest. And on the maturity, the issuer of, uh, of the bond returns the principal to the investor. So there are a lot of type of bonds in the market. There are corporate bonds, government bonds, and municipal bonds, depending on who is this issuer. It can be a, a corporation or it can be also a government or a municipal entity. Next slide, please. What are the advantages and disadvantages of bond investing? Very regular income flow. 
typically these bonds pay every quarter, every month, uh, every semester, every year, depending on the structure, lower risk compared to bonds. It helps also economic growth uh, as it's linked typically to uh, the, the company's uh, growth, but also the, the, the central bank growth and the amount of money they may issue. And in general, the economy impacts really as a direct impact on the economy. The disadvantage is, even if I wouldn't say it's a disadvantage even today, is uh, that th there is a lower return, even if we current inflation environment bonds are right now uh, uh, sort of a, a good bet in the sense of they can provide a higher interest rate because uh, they're pricing in a higher risk, uh, of uh, especially in the near term. Um, and, and you get also interest rate and credit risk. Uh, if you wish, if you buy a bond from a certain company and this company is in trouble, may not pay back uh, the, the the amount that uh, is promising you to pay, it goes bankrupt. You may never receive this money. The bond investor profile is quite similar uh, to uh, to for our investment point of view to equity, but it's more conservative. So typically there is a, a 60 40 rule of, of equity bond, uh, but it's not now, it's not anymore like a golden rule. But you usually is for the, uh, the people that are looking for a more steady uh, cash flow uh, without any or lower lower risk. Another asset class, which is a very hot at uh, this um, time specifically, are quick commodity. Commodity is a good basically used in uh, in commerce. Uh, you can buy goods in the spot market or using derivatives by future. Uh, cotton, oil, gas, corn, wheat, even orange juice is a, is a commodity. Of course, you may know gold, uh, silver, which is a very famous. And um, funny, funny story, this year, one of the most... Uh, Profitable asset class has been a commodity, not gold, even if it was, one, of course, on the top, but the soybean, which is not in this list. But uh, you may understand that uh, there is a direct impact in investing even something that you may not think at first, uh, at first glance. Let's move to the next slide. Advantages is advantage of commodity, diversification of portfolio. You want to build a portfolio which is as uh, diversified as possible, where you can contain risk or benefit from the good parts of your portfolio, which are performing well, and maybe not so much the bad parts, which are maybe are not performing today well, but they will perform better in the future. Is a very good edge against inflation. Now we live in inflationary times, and of course, uh, people are moving investment towards commodities, for example, gold. Uh, of course, it's a volatile asset. If you look at what happened in 2022, this was uh, among the commodity markets. There's been a lot of scarcity, but also a lot of volatility, uh, also because of the European political risk that are occurring uh, in, this, in this year. Last but not least, of course, we are just uh, looking at few asset classes, cryptocurrency. Well, this is a cryptocurrency. It is a, a digital or a virtual currency. Now it's a very popular trading choice, especially among the youngsters uh, with a, uh, a good value proposition and a lot of investment uh, in, 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 in the last few years. Uh, and everybody's talking about it, of course. Uh, if you move it to the next uh, slide, we can go through more details about cryptocurrencies. Of course, uh, high return possibility, but because it's a new market, is not mature in companies are not starting to invest in it or just starting to look at it it's most of a retail type of uh, uh, type of uh, asset class but these are new technologies like new technologies uh, they have the uh, ability to disrupt industries and uh, bring change of course if we if we say that commodities were uh, are quite a a uh, volatile asset. I think the most volatile asset of them all is uh, cryptocurrency, uh, as the price tends to move high uh, and low at a very fast pace. And so at the moment, it's merely used for speculation. There are, of course, other use cases which are more complex uh, about the decentralized finance or um, crypto trading, uh, which are more less uh, less speculative, but mostly is it, not is still not, I would say, a store of value, uh, but is mostly a speculation and regulated. But there are, of course, uh, uh, a lot of interest from uh, regulatory bodies to start regulating those. 
Uh, and of course, uh, we live in a world that should be quite sustainable. And uh, at the moment, cryptocurrency has a high energy con consumption for mining activities. Thanks was uh, the whole overview. Of course, uh, it was quite a small uh, talk, but uh, welcome any questions if you have it on uh, on uh, on the channel. Gabriella, thank you so much for that. And we'll go ahead and uh, switch to where I was a few minutes ago when I jumped the gun. If you would uh, pick a question from the audience questions on the university speaker's social media to answer, we'd appreciate that. Pick a pick one you like. Okay, let me just have a look. May you read some for one for me because I'm not able to look at it. I'm checking on the phone, but if you can uh, maybe read one for me. If I could have my producers feed one to me, I'd appreciate that. I can't see the social feed here either. I can see the page, but not the feed. Well, let me ask, I'll just, I'll, uh, can, you, can you buy a U.S., can, oh, here we go. Can a U.S. person buy non-U.S. based stocks? Yes, that's possible, as long as you uh, use uh, either uh, an app or an exchange which allows you trading. Trading is international. You can buy as a no, uh, U.S. stock so if you're not a non-U.S. investor, or non-U.S. stock if you're a, a, a U.S. investor. So there is no no limitation. Of course, in most general markets, there are some markets which are more more niche. But in general, I would say the answer is a, absolutely yes. You can. Okay. Well, we we kind of touched this with our last speaker. How much do you need to get started, and what advice would you give? Really, is a matter of of of, uh, of learning here, and how much uh, you you want to, you're willing to to put passion into into this. You can start with as little as uh, ten twenty dollars. Uh, we know, of course, uh, uh, you you will know that you will not make millions out of it, but it's a good uh, learning opportunity. And then you can start uh, increasing maybe your your investment. Of course, investing is uh, is for the long term. We said long stocks are for the long run, but in general, investment is something that may pay off in in the future it is a great investment opportunity so and learning opportunity so i would say start with as much as you can afford uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and learn on the way very good well thanks again for your time and your expertise and i'm sure there'll be some more social media questions that we'll get to after that so thank you so much and now that you've learned something about stocks and cryptos and all the things we just talked about you'll see a short video on how easy it is to buy your first stock in your first bitcoin ethereum or other cryptocurrency via today's partner app revolut i hope everyone's been successful in downloading the app and getting their 20 dollars bonus and we know there's a little time lag in there so you'll probably get it within hours if not yet so you'll be able to follow the trading tutorial and use the funds to invest to make your first trades let's see what that looks like hi everyone welcome back I hope you were all able to successfully download Revolut and claim your $20 reward and the trading course. Just in case you have not done it yet, you can follow the recording of this conference when you get in your email inbox, and you can get the $20 reward for a few more days by signing up using the promo code link in the description while the offer is still active. For those of you who have already downloaded and got set up with Revolut, let's open the app and learn how to use it. We are learning this now because throughout the rest of the conference, we will focus on cool investing related things that you can learn to apply in real life using Revolut. I will show you four of the coolest things you can do with Revolut. There are many, many other features too, but I personally find these four to be the most useful ones for me. So we will one, invest in cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Two, we'll invest in shares of a company like Tesla. Three, we'll send money to a friend. And lastly, we'll get ready for the next vacation in Europe and exchange some euros without getting charged anything. In general, if you're planning to travel abroad, you'll find many of these more useful tools in Revolut, such as travel insurance, airport lounge access, etc. At this point, I am legally required to tell you that I'm only going to show you how to buy shares of Tesla and some Bitcoin only as examples. And picking these examples over any others is not financial advice. You can choose from hundreds of other stocks and cryptos and should always do your own research before investing in a new stock or crypto. Now that we got that out of the way, let's get started with number one, buying cryptocurrency. Again, I advise you to follow along on your own phone. Once the app is open, we're going to select the crypto tab at the top, 
And here we see all things relevant to crypto traders, like the latest news and analysis and trading strategies, and even learn to earn program where you can earn $2 in crypto just by watching tutorial videos. I scroll down to popular cryptos and click on see all. Now you can browse through all the coins that are available on Revolut. I want to be able to call myself a Bitcoin owner, so I will select Bitcoin and click on it. And now I can enter the amount I want to invest in dollars. Whatever amount of Bitcoin in dollars that you want to buy, you enter here. So let me put $20 here and confirm by clicking the buy button. So there are a few screens here that you'll have to go through and, and read through. Click accept on your first time purchasing Bitcoin. We'll scroll through these, click accept. And then once you've done that, you'll be good to buy Bitcoin or any other crypto right away. That's it. Now I'm a proud owner of Bitcoin. And important to mention that again, there is zero commission charge for at least the first $200,000 of trades per month. If you trade more than $200,000, well, you should reach out and be a speaker here at the next conference. Back to small trades. What's next? Buying shares in Tesla or any other company traded on the stock market. It works very similar to stocks as it did for buying crypto. All right, we're all done with that. So we select the stocks tab at the top. And if it's your first time buying stocks, you're going to have to accept the terms and conditions and it can take a day or two until you're approved. Everyone who already got the app in advance at the conference can follow along on their phone again. If you are buying stocks for the first time, you'll need to transfer funds into your stock portfolio right here using the add money button, as you see that I just clicked, and you'll need to transfer money into this account so you can purchase stocks from the main Revolut account. So you can do that really quickly here. You can see I have a balance of $20. Um, I'll go ahead and add $5 here just to demonstrate it here. Click fund. And you now let's see, I have just funded my account. Now I have up to $30 available to buy in my stock portfolio. We have a huge number of stocks available and you can choose from anything really. So let's go ahead and look for Tesla as an example. Type that in and you'll see a similar interface as before when we bought some crypto. Let's go ahead and buy Tesla for $20. Do that same amount again, $20. And see, pro writes the share amount that I will get. Press the buy button, submit. Boom, there it is. I am now officially part of the cool club owning both Bitcoin and Tesla. Now, these are two of the investing features you will need to follow in the investing strategies of today's conference speakers. But I want to show you two more features that are very popular among approximately 20 million Revolut users around the world. That's right. There are already around 20 million Europeans using Revolut on a regular basis before it arrived in the U.S. this year. One is how to instantly send money or even crypto to friends for free. The last feature, I will show you how to be able to exchange dollars to euros for my summer vacation to Europe without losing any money at all on the exchange rate, like a normal bank and credit card would charge me. So now how cool is that? Okay, so how do we do that? In order to transfer crypto money to friends, I can go back to the home screen by clicking the, the first tab, which is accounts. So let me go back, go back to the accounts tab, and I'm going to click the transfer button here. And since I've given permission to access my contacts, I can now search friends by their name, phone number, email, their Revolut tag, which is basically their username there. Very similar how you would have a username on Instagram or Venmo. I select a friend, I can choose money, and now I can either send dollars or I can change the currency. So let me just take a look at this, set up this account. Just to demonstrate this here. So I select a friend, I choose how I want to send the money, and I can either send dollars, or in this example, I'll change the currency to any other currency I have in my account, for example, Euro or crypto like Bitcoin, which I bought earlier. Once you have that set up, you press send, and you're good to go. All right, let's go back and I'll quickly show you how to get Euros, Canadian dollars, or Mexican pesos, or any other currency exchange without losing money on the exchange rate. On the home screen, I click the three dots, then I click exchange, 
And here I can convert some of the dollars into euros, which will be automatically used for payments when I use my Revolut card next time I pay for a meal or a hotel or anything else in Europe. That's it. Enjoy your next trip abroad. Once you enter in your conversion, you can set it. Good to go. Press the blue button and you're all done. So I hope this was helpful for you guys. If you have any questions regarding Revolut, you can reach out to our team by responding to any of the emails you receive from us. Have a nice rest of your conference and happy investing. Well, great. Cool stuff. I can't wait to get going on my app. So I'm going to like to enjoy and ha, I would like to enjoy inviting our next speaker, Vince Hollerman. Vince is a young professional entrepreneur. He used to be a consultant at Morgan Stanley. And four and a half years ago, he decided to use his expertise and knowledge gained as a consultant to motivate and inspire people to reach their financial goals. So while you listen to Vince speak, please also ask your questions to him by commenting on the post you see linked in the description below. And then we'll choose one question for Vince to answer live. And the rest of your questions will be replied to via replies on the post. Vince? Hey, Grant, how's it going? Doing well. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, man. Um, I'm I'm really excited on this platform to be able to. Um, uh, I I really just wanted to talk about a, a couple areas of personal finance because I know this, you know, it's very very important. Um, you know, especially when it comes to investing, you know, really any career field or any industry that you want to be in, it's important that you have um, your personal finances in order so that you can really enjoy your money and really, you know, and enjoy what you want to do. I've got a couple questions here, and I don't want to put you on the spot for a whole presentation. So let's go with we all know budgeting is a foundational part of finances. So what are a few people, uh, what are a few ways that people can budget, especially since our uh, audience is a lot of college students and college attendees today? What do you got? But um, I, I think of budgeting more of permission to do what you want to do with your money when you want to do So, you know, first, come, I think what you really need to do is really understand like, who you are, your situation, um, and like what you like to do when it comes to budgeting. Um, and there's really like, there's like three ways that I, that I believe uh, can can impact you know young people or, or really anybody in general, like three ways to budget. So one of those ways is uh, the cash envelope system. Um, this is for people who who get money and you know it's like a hole in their pocket when they get money. As soon as they get it, they spend it. Cash envelope system is going to uh, allow you to to put your money in different places, different such as you know, for you know, expenses like gas or, or going to the restaurant, going, going out to eat, um, things of that nature, going out, vacation, stuff like that. And it's going to give you a, um, a certain amount of money or cash that you spend in those situations. That way you don't just blow cash whenever you get it, right? On just, and the other one uh, that's really good is the 50, 30, 20 plan. This is just an allocation plan, which is going to tell you um, 50% is going to your needs, 30% is going to saving and invest going to your wants. Um, what's key to know, know here is that it doesn't have to be strictly 50 to 20. I know a lot of people hear that and they're like, well, I can't live off 50% of my income. You can adjust it, right? You can adjust it to your lifestyle and how, how you're living. That's why it's important to really look at your situation and your lifestyle before you begin. But you can see 10, 10, right? Whatever floats your boat, whatever is best for you. And, and that's really for people who are more structured, right? Who, who make consistent income um, and who rather have a complete understanding of exactly where the money is going. And then from there, uh, for this is for the ones that don't really like the budget. I know a lot of people are going to like this one. Um, but if you don't want to sit down and, you know, go through your expenses and 
track your expenses and everything and track where your money is going to be the best choice for you when it comes to budgeting. So uh, this is this is where essentially you just set aside comes towards just saving and things that everybody should have a part of their foundation. And then with the other 80 to um, 90 percent of your income, you can really just enjoy life and do whatever you want to do with it. So, you know, if you're having trouble with budgeting, if you don't uh, like the thought of actually sitting down and looking at your numbers, um, that you're saving, make sure that you're investing, um, but also, you know, enjoy life at the same time. Cool. And Vince, I'm going to ask you to try uh, muting your video and just use audio. I'm getting a lot of breakup and uh, choppy on your end. So if you could just maybe do this next question with audio, we'll see if that helps us out or, or not. Um, next question is establishing good credit while young is obviously one of the best things you could do financially for your future. And one of the best ways to do that is by properly using a credit card. Give us some tips on best practices when using a credit card to establish good credit. So uh, first, first things first. Um, uh, what, you you want to treat your credit card like a debit card. So that's the first thing that you want to do. And what I mean by that is don't spend money on a card that you don't. So things that I teach and I and I do is um, I roughly purchases um purchases any of that because doing only how you create really horrible habits for your money and how you end up in situations that you don't really want to be in or end up in um uh, first the single month right and i'm, I'm I know there's people that say, well, you know, you should leave this amount on there. Uh, uh, balance just sort of bank, bank you're seeing everything. But, but, you know, I things of that nature. So, you know, if you're budgeting, like like I just talked about, if you have a budget, if you have a system in place, it really shouldn't be a problem for you. You should be able to pay off the balance every hey, single month. Vince. Vince, I'm going to interrupt again. Hey, Vince, I'm going to interrupt again. We are getting some uh, really bad choppy on your audio. So we're going to move on with our next speaker. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to loop back to you or not. I apologize for kind of cutting you short, but it's like one of those bad phone calls when you're out in the uh, hinterlands and you're getting about every fifth word. So we'll go ahead and move on. Thank you again for uh, dedicating time to us this afternoon. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Adnan Jesarovic. He is a master graduate in finance and until a few months ago was an analyst in Morgan Stanley in Europe when he decided to join a startup with his friends. And please click the link in the description and post any questions that come up for Adnan on the University Speakers Instagram post that opens up. We will choose one question for Adnan to answer live like we've done with the others. And the rest of the questions will re be replied to via Instagram. Adnan? Uh, hi, Grant. I hope you can hear me. We can. So far, so good. So far, so good. All right. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak in front of a such large audience. Uh, I'm going to, uh, given that I'll give a presentation on, uh, like a short presentation on stock investing, I'm going to share my screen and uh, see and where, okay, here is my presentation and yeah, please confirm if you can see it so I can proceed. Yes, we can see it just fine. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. So uh, I'll give the, uh, the, the topic of today is the basics of stock investing. Uh, I will continue. The, the, the presentation builds upon what Gabriella was explaining just a little bit earlier. So the topics that we'll cover today is the uh, definition of investing, um, the dynamics of stock pricing, so how uh, stock pricing is determined in the markets, 
uh, the value of uh, new information, like how it determines the how new information determines the uh, stock valuation and pricing, and finally how new inf investors can protect themselves uh, in, during their investing by diversifying their uh, portfolio. So let me start. The definition of investing uh, assumes an act of allocating resources with the expectation of generation of generating an income or profit in the future. So most common forms of investing are through property, shares, which you're going to cover today, bonds and commodities, as well as starting a business. So, uh, so stocks, stock, a stock is a certificate representing a partial ownership in the firm. So a stock owner receives several bonuses and several benefits uh, besides becoming a part owner of the firm. He may receive potential future dividends and a potential increase in value of the stock, right? So that is the, this part, the potential increase in the value of the stock is the most, uh, is the thing that most investors are interested in. So uh, stocks are traded on highly regulated public stock exchanges. So this is very important. So these uh, stock exchanges are regulated by the SEC and FINRA. And every publicly stock uh, publicly exchange company has to fulfill a certain criteria to be able to be uh, listed on these on these exchanges. So all these stock markets work like other financial markets. So they link the surplus units, that is, the investors that have excess funds that want to sell a certain stock, with deficit units. So that those investors then want to buy a stock to produce a pricing equilibrium. So where's uh, demand and supply meets in the middle. So that's where this pricing equilibrium begins. Now here I'll have to say something a, a little bit about price and value because um, these might not always be the same for uh, for a certain stock. And there are many, many factors which affect which can, which can affect both of these. So Investors in general, investors conduct valuations of stocks when making their investment decisions, right? They buy a stock when its market price is below their valuation or sell when the market price is above their valuation. And they, they can use different models and methods to determine what the value of, of this stock is. So usually there are these funda fundamental versus technical analysis. Fundamental analysis implies finding the intrinsic value of the company based on the fundamentals. So this usually includes a deep dive in the, uh, in the company's financial statements. Whereas technical analysis relies on analyzing the stock price trends. So this um, usually chart analysis comes under, under technical analysis. So uh, previously I said that new information is detrimental in determining the stock, uh, stock price. In theory, uh, the pr current price of the stock reflects all the information which is available on that company. So when we're entering the market, when we want to buy a certain stock, we assume that all the investors have already chewed up all the information which is available in on a certain company, and that's reflected in the, in the current price. So only new information, which is going to come up sometimes in the future, can affect the the market price, right? So, and we'll we'll see how that works. For, for our following for example, we'll take Apple. Let's say that Apple released its new iPhone and they have broken its sales record. So, iPhone's been selling like crazy. So, this will prompt the investor to think, well, Apple is going to perform great, right? So, let me revise my method, my my model, so that the value of Apple in, in my valuation is going to go higher, right? And if that is the general consensus among all the investors or majority of the investors, that because Apple has been performing greatly, they've been selling uh, a record number of their new iPhones, uh, this, will go, this is going to create an upward pressure on the, uh, in the markets. You know, there's going to be a lot more people wanting to buy Apple stock, which is going to push the price higher in the markets, right? So that is the that's the value of new information on on the market. And uh, for for a final uh, slide, I will speak about uh, how new how beginner investors can uh, minimize their risk. Right. So diversification is has been uh, uh, taunted as the like the, the best way to to minimize risks. And therefore, uh, to beginner investors, I will introduce the S and P five hundred index. It's uh, 
of course, one of the most well-known, if not the most well-known uh, stock index in the world. Uh, it's an index of 500 leading publicly traded companies in the US. And given its broad sector diversification, so including tech companies, financials, utilities, etc., it's safer than buying a single stock. So in case that one uh, one sector is overperforming and the other sector is underperforming, those kind those will kind of uh, negate each other, and uh, you know your losses are not going to be um, as uh, as noticeable, right? So. And additionally, S&P 500 delivered consistent returns over the years, right? 11.17% per year over the past 50 years and 14.5% over the past 10 years. So it delivered con consistent returns. Even in 2020, when the world was ravaged by COVID and most of the countries were in lockdown, S&P 500 delivered almost 20%, which is like re really good. And uh, as an option for beginner investors, uh, like the easiest options are to go into index funds or ETFs, uh, exchange traded funds. And these are passive investments which just track, simply track the performance of the S&P 500 index. Uh, so that's it for the, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I hope I'll go back into the stream and see if there are any, any question uh, for me. Uh, okay, so one question, Adnan, is how yeah. does the pandemic and the Ukraine war affect U.S. stock prices? Hmm. Well, I would say that this is mostly due to the geopolitical risk, right? Uh, Europe has become a little bit more unsafe option for worldwide investors, right? And given that the U.S. is geographically isolated from all of this happening, right? Uh, a lot of the investors are going to flock into the U.S. market. We have seen that with strengthening of the U.S. dollar. Uh, it has never happened before that uh, U.S. dollar and euro have become equal uh, in, terms of, in terms of value. And that has happened because there's a lot of inflow from all around the world into the U.S. Uh, so the U.S. stock uh, stock market is, I think, going to perform greatly, especially the uh, military industrial complex, right? Uh, Lockheed Martin and uh, these these guys. Surprise, surprise, surprise. surprise okay, surprise. well, thank you, Adnan. We thank appreciate you, your, yeah, we thank you for your time and investment in all the great information. And uh, like's been mentioned in chat, you can connect with a lot of these people, our speakers on Instagram. It'd be really probably smart to do. Our next speaker is Juan Ruiz. And Juan is currently at Harvard Business School and the founder of Communa ETA, a student-run private equity fund. Prior to HBS at Harvard Business School, Juan was a vice president at a private equity firm, Blue Road Capital, where he invested $500 and more as part of an investment team of six. Prior to Blue Road, <clears throat> excuse me, Juan was an investment banking and capital markets analyst at Citigroup. He was born and raised in Medellin, Colombia, and holds a BBA in finance with honors from University of Miami. Juan will present first on the basics of some stock investing, and then we'll share some very valuable information related to personal finance. So I think we're just going, as I understand Juan, we're just going to jump to questions. So if you're on, I'm going to throw my first question at you. What is the purpose of having a personal finance strategy? And could you define that a little bit for us, please? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Grant, for having me on. And um, hi to everyone who, who's watching right now. I really appreciate the time, the opportunity to be on here, share some, some insights with you guys. Um, what is the purpose of, of having a personal finance strategy? Um, if we start with starting with the end in mind, I think that the purpose of a personal finance strategy is to achieve financial freedom. And generally, I like to define financial freedom very broadly as basically independence from money itself. In other words, it's about reaching a state where you are free to live the life that you want and do the things that you do uh, or not do the things that you don't do. But of course, all of us want different things and want to live different lives. And so that means by necessity that financial freedom and, and having a personal finance strategy has different meanings for all of us. Personally, for me, my childhood dream was to be a fund manager. And so my personal strategy 
in, in personal finance was designed around that goal, right? So specifically, I am aim to earn, save, and invest enough to afford going to business school, to Harvard Business School, and eventually launch my own private equity fund. Uh, of course, this kind of entrepreneurial venture carries some risks and requires certain capital. And so throughout my um, early years, right out of college, I was focused in uh, designing a personal finance strategy that helped me achieve that. Someone else's dream or, or definition of uh, financial independence might be different. And so they might want to, I don't know, get a certain job or live in a certain place or retire at a certain age. So their um, financial freedom and their means to achieve those types of lives is going to be different. Fascinating. So what is an optimal personal finance strategy and maybe bust it down to some uh, really salient points for our college audience? Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to try and define it broadly and uh, try and really, uh, from, from my experience, from my personal experience, give um, some insights. And then hopefully we're going to be able to dive into, into an example here without getting too much into the weeds, right? So again, starting with the end in mind, a personal finance strategy that's optimal is one that helps you achieve your definition of financial freedom. Right. And so we, if we go back to the prior question, we said financial freedom is reaching a state where money is not an obstacle to live out your dreams. Um, so you need to define a strategy that helps you save enough so that money is not an obstacle to live the life that you want. Um, but I'm going to add something else on top of that. Right. And, and that is optionality. And so let me redefine that an optimal personal finance strategy is one that helps you achieve your definition of financial freedom and gives you optionality. And, and optionality is key mainly because you will change as you age, right? And so perhaps what you thought was the life of your dreams when you were 22, when you were 20, when you were 25 is going to change when you become, you know, when you turn 28 and maybe not, and, and it can change one way or the other, right? Maybe as you age, which is in my case, actually this happened, I realized that I needed less to live the life that I wanted. And so my strategy changed, uh, but, but at a high level, that that's it. But let's focus on optionality. Um, so even if we have different goals, even if we want to achieve different things, there are certain things that we all can do early in our careers to ensure that optionality, right? And this is gonna sound a little trite and a little cliche, but I think those three things that we can do are, um, I like to put it this way, just so so it, it sticks with people. And, and this is all relative, right? Compared to the average person, compared to the rest of people, uh, if you really want to be purposeful about your personal finance strategy, there are three main things that you have to do. And everything else are tweaks, right? Everything else is, is conversation. But if you do these three things, which, which I did, and I'm going to help you walk through, through an example here, you will ensure that you keep that optionality so that regardless of how much you need at the end of the day to uh, move to XYZ country, to re retire at whatever age, to launch whatever venture, to spend whatever time with your family, if you do these three things, eventually um, you're going to have the option to um, go and pursue those dreams and, and have a leg up on on, on, on people who, who are not following this. And again, this is going to sound cliche, but uh, it's the things that help me achieve my financial freedom. And the first one is get a high paying job. Um, the second one is be frugal. And the third one is invest aggressively. Let's actually uh, drive it, the point home a little bit further. And which the way actually I lived it is earn double spend half and invest the difference compared to the average person if you're able to earn double spend half and invest the difference you're going to be so much further ahead in terms of your personal finance goals and just so you capture or, or get a sense of the magnitude of the difference that this one this thing can make uh doing those three things can make in your personal finances i'm going to walk you 
through uh, an easy example, and I'm not going to get too deep into the math just because uh, I'm, we're not following a screen here, but let's just talk about what the average person uh, makes in the United States. Uh, so right out of college, people are earning $55,000 gross income, right? That's according to U.S. News. Um, the national savings rate is around 6%, according to the BEA. And uh, the historical rate of return, uh, I think Adnan was showing us that it was uh, for the past 10 years, I think somewhere around 14%. And uh, I think it was 10% for a longer period of time. Um, net of inflation in the past 20 years, the S&P 500 is around 6.5%, right? Um, so those those are three three key data points, right? People on average are earning 55,000 when they get out of college. They're saving around 6% of the money that they take home after taxes and their options to invest return around six and a half percent a year, right? Um, so if you make 55,000, you're gonna be paying around $10,000 in taxes. You're taking home around 45,000. And of that, you're saving around 6% or on average people are saving around 6%. That's around $2.7,000 or $2,700, right? Um, if you're, if you want to maintain your level of spending, which is roughly $40,000 after you save, you need a nest egg or, or an investment portfolio of around a million dollars, right? To safely spend that money every year and achieve that financial freedom. And let's just assume that financial freedom for you here means I want to count on $40,000 or my current level of spending without having to do the work that I'm doing because I want to dedicate my time to something else. It'll take you around 40 years if you're saving $2,700 and investing them at a net return of 6.5%. So if you make 55, you spend as most people spend and you invest the difference, it's going to take you around 40 years. Now let's take the other example, which is what I'm suggesting. Someone who makes double, spends the half and invest the difference. You will be making $110,000. You'll be taking home around 85,000 after taxes, but you would be living on half what the average person lives. You're just being very frugal and very um, intentional about your spending habits because you have a goal in mind. And so you're spending around $21,000, right? And you're investing the difference, which is around 64,000, right? If you invest those 64, at the 6.5% rate, so in the S&P 500 as well, then it'll only take you around 10 years to reach that million bucks, right? Which is what you need, assuming that financial freedom here means that for you. So that was a lot of numbers and we went back and forth, but at a high level, what I wanna drive home is the average is 55,000. If you make the effort in college to get a job or through passive income or through side gigs or whatever, make double, you make the effort to spend half by being very frugal and you invest the difference, you're going to be able to achieve what the average person achieves in 40 years in only 10 years, right? Um, and that's exactly what I did. So when I was in school, I majored in finance and I realized very quickly that I wanted to be a fund manager. And that is, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial venture within finance. I wanted to launch either a hedge fund or a private equity fund. I wanted to be a professional investor. And so I identified the path that would take me there, which was going into investment banking, which happened to be a high paying job. Um, and then into private equity, which also happened to be a high paying job. And I was making about double what my peers made uh, on average. And I was saving, I, I would say I was spending more than half, or sorry, less than half than my peers were spending. So I was saving very aggressively and investing very aggressively. In addition to, to those three things, I was also investing better because again, I had a purpose in mind. And so while we're talking here about the S&P 500, which is a very safe bet, as Adnan mentioned, is a great vehicle to invest in the long term. It's really good to also have, um, if you have the time and the, and the knowledge and, and you do research on your own, other investment options that perhaps could be better for you. So just to go back to the original question, a personal finance strategy is one that, again, brings you closer to your financial freedom goals and gives you optionality.
I would say that for anyone graduating out of college that is not going to be, I guess, you know, a pop star or a sports um, athlete or whatever, you should go and try and get a very high paying job, live very frugally for the first five to 10 years and invest aggressively. I would say that's that's my answer to that, Grant. Thank you, Juan. So I'm going to ask you one more question before we let you go. So in my mind, uh, you can tell that my pop star status didn't come around like I thought it was going to. Uh, so what can a college student do right now to secure a higher paying job in the field than the average jobs that are available? What can they do? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and you'd be surprised. I think that uh, I would say that there are, there are mainly three things. The first one is start early, right? So if you're a senior, you can still try and get your, and that's actually how my story went, but uh, start as early as you can. So if you're listening to this and you're a freshman, start researching and trying to find what those high paying jobs are, right? It's very easy to say, oh, they're only finance and tech. Um, but I would say that's a lazy answer. You should go in and do the research what finance means. There are very different functions in finance. What does tech mean? There are very different functions in tech. And there are other high paying jobs out there that I'm just not aware of or I'm not familiar with because of the route or path that I chose. So that's number one, start early. Number two is match what you're good at with your passion. Try different things, right? So if you are good with numbers, then try and do an internship that would lead to a high paying job with numbers. If you are good with, um, I don't know, something else, uh, communication, writing, try and do an internship in a field that leverages that and could end up in a high paying job. So that would say um, it's number two. And then number three is be relentless and grind as much as you can. At the end of the day, there are only so many high paying jobs and it's a competitive uh, market out there, right? So there are other folks or peers are trying to go after them. But if you start early, if you match your passions with your your talents, what you're good at, and then you grind really, really hard, um, you're going to have a really, really good shot of getting a high paying job. Again, these sound cliche. These sound like things that your grandfather has been telling you for the past how many years, but they're true. Uh, and that's personally the formula that I followed um, to get where I am today. We're going to call you Grandpa Juan from now on. So just so you know, hey, I'm going to put you on the hot seat for a 60 second question. So what are options? You just kind of touched on this, but what is an option for some of our students who aren't able to get that perfect, as it were, high paying job? Yeah, um, the, 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 I would say, I mean, if you think about it mathematically, the average gets $55,000. And, and those three things that I mentioned make double, spend half, invest the difference is the optimal thing, right? But mathematically, everyone will not be able to do that. Uh, and, the re the, and, and why? Because mathematically, you know, most people are going to be in the average and only some people are going to get a high paying job, some people are going to get low paying jobs. But even if you can't make double, try and make more. And even if you can't live on half, try and live on less. So, and, and then as one of the three doesn't result in, I guess, the optimal outcome, uh, try and get it as closer uh, to it as possible and really focus on the other ones. So if you graduate and you're making, let's say 55 as the average, um, well, try and live on less than half of what people are making. I know folks that didn't get their dream job out of college and they weren't making as much money and they moved in with their parents um, for like two years while they saved very aggressively and invested the difference. And they also carved out more time to invest um, the difference. So I would say don't uh, put yourself down if you're not getting that high paying job. You're a senior right now. You don't have a job lined up. Uh, give yourself time, right? Uh, and eventually if you follow the other two pillars, you're going to end up doing better than, than most people. Juan, thank you so much. That is uh, great information and a lot of high value stuff for our students. So thank you so much for your investment of time with us this afternoon. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And Thanks, now everyone. I'm Thanks, going Grant. to, 
Oh, yes, I'm sorry. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Mar Prevet. Mar is a financial planner at Revolution Financial Management, a company that helps individuals, families, and businesses create a sound financial strategy for their future based on reducing debt, saving money, and protecting asset value. That's some smart stuff there. And while you listen to Mar speak, please go ask some questions to her by commenting on the post you see that we're going to link in the description. We will choose one of those questions uh, as we can live, and the rest of the questions will be replied to as we look at the post. Good afternoon, Mar. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> I am wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm going to get you going with some some great questions here. So you you seem to enjoy working in the financial services industry. How'd you get started? I do. I absolutely love what I do. I've always had a passion for it. Um, and really where it came from, we kind of have to like rewind a little bit. So I come from an immigrant family and I'm going to be honest, my mom coming from Brazil had no idea what to do with finances. And so because I was going to traditional school, she assumed I'm learning this in school, right? Well, wrong as many of us are on here because we don't learn this stuff in school. And so I was making decisions and I was having to give financial advice as a child, believe it or not, at like 10 years old. She's like, should I refinance? Should I do this? And I'm looking at her. I have no idea what to say, but I had to kind of figure it out. And so that's kind of where it started for me. I just started researching on my own. And then soon enough, because of my own research, I just became so passionate about understanding finances, but also being able to teach other people what to do. And I quickly realized being that I come from an immigrant family and everyone around me had no idea what they were doing, even the people who didn't come from immigrant families, because there was such a lack of knowledge. And so because of that, my husband and I, we started our, our business because we wanted to not just help people in this area, but actually educate them. Because we realized if you're not learning it in schools, if your parents don't know it, they're not going to teach you. So we figured if it's to be, it's up to us. And so we decided that we were going to start an educational form of finances for people to not just get things taken care of and get in order, but also to understand. Because when there's knowledge, there also is an ability for people to know how to teach their, their children, but also not to get taken advantage of. Because when it comes to finance, um, traditionally in our industry, there's just people who kind of just tell others what to do blindly, they follow, and sometimes it's not always the best. And so that's why we started doing what we're doing because there was just a lack of knowledge and we figured why not be the ones to fill that need. I know when I took some college courses and had to learn dual level fractions, I was thinking how great it would be just to learn how to do a tax form, but what do I know? So about that, what's something you wish you knew about money say 10 years ago? So 10 years ago, believe it or not, I would have been 18. And the thing that I so badly wish I knew was to start investing young. Um, I did not realize things like the, the rule of 72. And so I'm going to kind of give you guys a quick little breakdown of just a principle that I wish I understood because the rule of 72 essentially illustrates compound interest. And compound interest is something that you can use to basically make your money grow while you're asleep. This is something that the rich and wealthy, the top 1% know, but us 99 don't. And so to illustrate that, the rule of 72 says this, you take the number 72, you divide it by your rate of return, and that equals the number of years it takes your money to double. So let's say I have a bank account that's getting 1% rate of return. Now, realistically, if you look on your statement, it's nowhere near that. It's like 0 0.06, like it's so small, it's not even close. But for this illustration, let's say it's 1%. So we take 72, we divide it by one, and that equals 72. So that means it's 72 years for that money to double. Now, I know, and I'm sure you know, 72 years from now, that's a little bit too long for my money to double. So that's why the rich and wealthy use different strategies of investment where they can actually get rates of return like 10%. So let's try it. 72 divided by 10, and you can put it in the chat, but it's super simple. 72 divided by 10, it's 7.2. So rather than that money doubling every 72 years with a 1% rate of return, 
at the 10% rate of return, my money is doubling every 7.2 years. That's a huge, huge difference. But again, I didn't realize that there were things like this as far as compound interest. It just, I did not realize it. And so I, I wish I did. I wish I had started sooner because I would be able to use that compound interest to my, um, you know, benefit essentially. And the other thing too, that I did not know about until I started getting in financial um, services was there's a whole um, se section and category that's called index, index strategy, which when I was first, you know, getting into this and researching, I thought, well, if there's any sort of investment, it has to be, you know, either stocks or real estate, which both can be kind of volatile, especially if you don't know what you're doing. But that's not the case. If you have an index strategy, and we can talk more about that, you guys can put questions in there on um, my post, and I'm happy to answer them. But with index strategy, you actually can have protection from down markets, but still utilizing and getting the benefits of when the market's up. Because what happens with an index strategy is rather than going down when the market tanks, you actually just lock in your latest gain and flatline. So again, if I had known this at 18, I would have started investing in index strategies so like immediately. The day I turned 18, I would have done that, but I didn't know that. The only thing that I was taught, like many of us I'm sure on here was get a credit card. And that's pretty much it. And so that would be the advice I would say is investing early, like start as soon as possible. But the other thing too is utilize index strategies because they're to your benefit and you don't have to sit there and, you know, be a guru at this point. You can actually utilize them, have protection from down market, but still capitalize on those gains. Stuff. That's really good stuff. Thank you for that, Mar. So let's talk about some common myths about money that you learned and maybe have debunked? One of the biggest ones, this is my favorite question, is we kind of touched on it, but it's waiting to get out of debt to invest. Now, this might seem super counterculture, but think about it. We just talked about compound interest and utilizing that to your benefit. If I'm waiting until I'm fully out of debt, then I'm missing out on the years that my money could be compounding. And so it's a horrible strategy, realistically, when you're thinking about it, waiting just so that you are then compounding, because here's the principle you can be utilizing is compounding even a small amount. It's still growth regardless, because if you utilize the strategy and at least start investing and compounding your money, even with a small amount and later on build it to, you know, a bigger amount, a vast amount you're still getting at least some growth. And when you're not investing it, you're getting zero growth. And here's another thing that I want to point out. When we think about inflation right now, it's so high, right? It keeps going higher and higher. And we don't know when it's going to stop, if it's going to stop, no crystal ball in play just yet. I hope so, but not yet. And because of that, when we are just not taking account of inflation and we're keeping our money in the bank, well, the money in the bank the rate of return on there is not matching inflation. So when you think about it in that perspective, leaving my money in the bank just so that I can pay off debts or whatever, it's not growing. So in reality, because it's not matching even inflation, it's almost going backwards. So one of the huge like things that I would just, I'm not trying to impress anyone here, but I'm trying to press upon you the importance of not waiting till you're out of debt. Even if you have to start small, at least that small is getting compound interest. And so that's a huge part that I want to debunk and also debunk the fact that like a part of that is people think, oh, I have to invest like this huge lump sum, like from an inheritance or something crazy. That's that's actually not true at all. You can start small, like we said, and get that compounding interest. And then, you know, as you get the big jobs, as you, you know, step into your own, into your career and you can contribute more for it to have more money in order to compound, then you can utilize that. But ultimately, I just wanted to make sure that everyone walks away understanding that you don't have to wait till you're out of debt to start investing and start utilizing compound interest. And it doesn't have to be a huge amount either. That most people make when it comes to money. So one common mistake that I see often is people will 
And we're in an era that is amazing. We can search everything online, right? Any question I have, I can Google it. And some people are saying, actually, there's a huge um, fight between Google and TikTok because now people are actually going on TikTok and searching things instead of Google. But again, people will search things and it's in good faith, right? They're trying to understand. They're reading articles. They're going on Investopedia. Um, they're taking advice just from anyone and everyone. But I want to caution everyone because... When you are just taking advice blindly from articles or people that are just generalizing, right? They don't speak in specifics. That's where I would wave a red flag. Um, the reason why is because finances are not one size fits all. And so because it's not one size fits all, overgeneralizing, it's, it's a little dangerous because it might not be the best fit for you. And so I would really try to... Um, get the point across that you need to speak to someone that can be objective and that actually knows, you know, what they're talking about. I know I've, especially at this age, um, I remember being in college and just going to, you know, my rich uncle and being like, what do you think? And realistically, he was doing his best to give me advice, but it wasn't tailored to me, to my situation. And so I would say sit down with a financial professional that can be um, subjective, right? Or not subjective, objective, and um, be able to give you advice on your situation, to be able to create a plan that gets you to where you want to be eventually. If it's, you know, whatever that financial freedom looks like, like Juan was talking about, it might be different for every person, but ultimately you won't know how to get there until you sit down with a professional to talk through and strategize. Um, and so, Ultimately, just don't take overgeneralized advice. Um, and really, the other thing, too, is don't take advice from people who aren't where you want to be. Um, that's another huge factor that counts for finances, but also entrepreneurship, too. I'm sure we've got plenty of entrepreneurs on here, is that if you're taking advice from people who aren't where you want to be, um, that's probably not the best bet for you to get to where you want to be because they don't know themselves. And so that would be my advice is just don't take overgeneralized advice, make sure you're sitting down with someone so that they can come up with a tailored plan for you because finances are personal and everyone has different goals, needs. Um, and so you want to make sure that that's taken care of, that's tailored to you specifically. Cool. Thanks, Mar. I got one more for you. So many people don't have a formal education in fi finance and can be easily intimidated by the idea of investing. I know that kind of scares me. So what are some ways we can protect ourselves? So that's a really good one. I'm trying to think what would be my number one thing, because I could go on and on about that, to be honest. But I would say really... Um, it kind of goes back to, you know, having an objective opinion from a financial professional. The reason why is because they can point out the blind spots that maybe you don't see, but also give you the realistic um, blueprint to get you to where you want to be. Because if you have no idea what you're doing, um, first off, it can be pretty dangerous. You could be losing a lot. Um, the other thing too, is that um, you don't want to just blindly follow instruction. What I mean by that is you want to make sure that when you're sitting down with someone that's objectively um, helping you along, you want to make sure that they're educating you. That's one of the number one principles that I think really make sure that they're educating you on it because you want to know how this affects you, how this impacts you, um, what you know can you expect? Um, because if there's a lack of knowledge there, you could potentially get taken advantage of. And I've seen it. I've, I sit down with like 10, 20 people a day and I've seen it where they'll sit down and they're like, Oh, like this was set up for me. And I think I'm on track. I just wanted a second opinion. And I look and I realize what was put in place for them really doesn't best serve like their goals and their needs. And so then I have to educate them like, Hey, were you aware of this? And they're usually like, Oh, I had no idea. So then I educate them on this and then I help them. So that would be the number one thing is, make sure you're getting educational um, help on this, not just uh, blindly telling you what to do and you just follow it and you have no idea how it impacts you. Thank you, Mar. That is wonderful advice. And thank you so very much for being here today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday afternoon. And of course, everyone can hit you on your Instagram account and get some more great advice. Thanks for having me. It was amazing. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks again. And now I'm going to invite our next speaker, Alec. 
Angelov and Alec, I've got some questions for you if you're hanging around out there. Yeah, here I am. All Thank right. You. We're going to give you, you the, so the grilling, boy. You got to be ready for us. Here we go. Are you ready? Let's go. All right. So what do you believe is the most important skill you need to invest in? Awesome. So first of all, I just want to uh, take uh, a minute to thanks everyone who has stayed until, uh, you know, this time and everyone who has joined us. I really appreciate it. And, you know, just to answer your, your question, the most important skill to invest in, uh, you know, I think it's essential to invest in sales. Uh, I'm a sales expert. And the reason I state, I know I'm a little bit biased, but for me, you need to know uh, how to communicate to people your value. And the majority of people, what they get wrong about sales is that sales is only about, you know, the transaction, about the money. And they have this picture of, you know, a car salesman. But sales is also about communicating your own value to people, whether that's in an interview, whether that's just an idea that you want to communicate to someone. So I think if you want to build your personal finance, you need to know sales. It's essential. Cool. And Alec, I apologize. I kind of skipped your intro. I was so excited about getting you in questions. Let me do a quick intro. Alec <laughs> is a sales and marketing expert. And we'll get more of that in a second. He is co-founder of CEO Sphere an exclusive community for coaches, content creators, entrepreneurs, and small business owners looking to boost visibility online and increase sales. Alec holds a master's degree in forensic psychopsychology. Well, that sounds interesting. We can do a whole talk on that and has worked as a coach in European Polygraph Academy. Huh. Well, while you listen to Alec speak, please ask your own questions to him by commenting on the post we just linked in there. And then we'll uh, grab one of these questions at the end. So thanks again. And uh, let's just quit talking about finance and talk about polygraph machines. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. So, okay. So back to the questions. What would you say is the number one skill besides being able to lie on a polygraph? What is the number one skill to build personal finance and achieve financial freedom? As I mentioned, you know, for me, the most important skill has to be sales. You know, I touched a little bit on it, but sales tends to be a combination of other skills, right? So this is why I started uh, forensic psychophysiology. The, the main thing is, you know, everything in life comes to human psychology and the way you are capable to translate the value that, that you have in your business, the value of your service and your own personal value. So if you want to build personal finance, you need to learn sales so that you can express to people your own personal value. Why are you important to someone else? Whether that is by, you know, giving them emotional support, whether that is by solving a specific problem, but why should people trust you and why should people work with you, right? So in order for you to build your personal finance, learn sales, which is a variety of skills, including communication, psychology, persuasion, and marketing, to name a few. I almost hear you saying, if you can't sell anything else, learn how to sell yourself. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, I think one of the most essential things that you can do is to be able to communicate your value. Uh, the majority of people, we were stuck in a world in which we are getting sold by the minute, right? Everything that we are doing uh, consistently, it's selling ourselves. So right now, I'm trying to convince people of what I'm saying, that sales is important, right? And in order for me to do so, I need to first showcase that I have some knowledge right why should people listen to me so in order to do that right i will have to communicate effectively my value so if you want to sell anything first learn how to sell yourself effectively uh, so let's talk about personal finance now what would you say is the number one skill besides sales to build the personal finance and achieve that financial freedom where would you go first Okay, if I were to, you know, go beside sales, I would, I would actually not focus on, on, on the skills as per such. I would focus on trying to invest in myself, 
okay? And invest just in general into what exactly do you need in order to build your personal finance moving forward. And in order for me to do that, I would analyze what are my passions, right? If you actually enjoy doing something, you tend to be good at it. So I would understand what are my strengths, okay? What is something that I may be good at? We're not talking great. And that would put effort into that exact thing, which is different for everyone else, right? So that tends to be something that I enjoy, but it tends to be also something that other people enjoy because I'm so great at it. So I would identify what is already something that I'm great at, which, you know, for so many people, it's it's a variety of things. It's, it's different things. And, you know, by identifying that, then you're capable of communicating that with high value and therefore being able to build your personal finance and understanding in what direction you can go in order for you to achieve the best results for your personal finance. Nice. Cool. So thank you for that. So remembering that our audience today is a lot of college attendees and recent graduates. What is the one piece of advice about personal finance you would give to your audience that you wish you had known earlier in your career? That's a fantastic question. I think the most important thing that everyone should remember is that when life is very long, it may also be short. So the things that you want to do you should probably start doing them now and you should be experimenting because what happens today, what happens this week, what happens even this month will not actually have a major effect on your life unless you make it have that effect for good or bad. So by starting to do things, by putting things in motion, right, by actually taking action on the things that you love, you're capable of actually seeing what works for you or what doesn't. So I wish I knew that I could experiment more. I could worry less about the things that are happening on every day. And it's it's less about winning this week. It's more about winning this year. Okay, so focus on the compound of your actions, right? By doing consistently actions in the right direction, you're going to be able to build your personal finance. And that is why it's super important that people start investing early, that they make mistakes early, because from those mistakes is what, how they're going to learn how to get better. And failure does not exist as long as you never quit. Okay, so if you never quit, you cannot fail. So therefore, start doing, make mistakes, and, and it's fine. You're all young, so you have the time to make mistakes. Tough. So here's a tough one for you. If you lost everything, what would you oh do God. first tomorrow to build your personal finance again? Right. So if I lost everything, uh, what would I do? I would first focus on the current knowledge that I have. Right. And this is why it's so important for people to invest in themselves first. You can never lose an investment that is in yourself or in your business. You, you're always going to either get a lesson, right? Or you're going to gain from it. So I would focus in my, my knowledge and what I already know, right? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm great at sales. I'm great at marketing. So I would pick a product that is in demand and I would take 10 times the action that I'm already taking, right? So I would contact 10 times more people and I would build my network. Right. We, we often heard that, you know, your network is your network. Well, it's actually true. You only need one person to believe in you in order for things to change for you. So have conversations with a lot of people. Show a lot of curiosity. Right. Talk to other people. Talk about how they are doing and try to collaborate. Right. Life is all about collaboration and support. And if you're capable of identifying the people who are going to make you stronger and allow you to get ahead, okay, will you help them get ahead? You're going to make it big. You're going to be able to build your personal finance based on that line of support. So 
I would say people should start networking. And that's exactly what I would do. I would start networking, having conversations and being in active search of opportunities in order for me to grow once again my audience on social media, to actually, you know, move forward in my career and, you know, progress towards that path that I want to progress. So that's what I would do, Grant. Great, great advice. We've got uh, two more questions for you. One is coming from the chat. What awesome. about saving money at home? Do you keep cash around the house? I think keeping cash in general, it's it's good. And I like to keep some. And what I try to do is I like to keep different currencies, right? And I try to analyze the situation of where, where the dollar goes, where does the euro go? And, you know, keeping it at home or keeping it in the bank, what I would say it's more effective is if you're capable of putting it in a fund and actually getting some extra return on those savings. So savings on their own, okay, it doesn't bring you much more. I always say have a cushion net, have a safety net, but you don't necessarily need that big of a safety net. Focus on reducing okay, how much you actually spend and more in how much you earn consistently, right? So what is a predictable income that you have that you can rely on? And that it's way more effective than just keeping cash at home. Cool. Well, thank you for that. So here's your last one. You have an MA in forensic psychophysiology. I actually said it right that time. What are some things you've learned there that made you better in sales or business? That, that's such an awesome question. You know, Grant, uh, forensic psychophysiology, for, for people who may not know, is, is the art of, you know, human behavior and just in general applying lie detection uh, via the, the use of a polygraph, right? And the one thing that I always notice when I go to do a polygraph or whenever I am trying to catch someone lying, right, is first of all, the observation of, of their behavior, okay? And, and second of all, the emotional intelligence that I have gained in order to understand where people are and how they are feeling. This is something that I have applied not only in sales, but actually in my current life too, right? It's the practice of empathy and gaining a high level of emotional intelligence that will allow me to understand if people are being sincere or not. And in many occasions, people in sales, they tend to lie not necessarily because they want to, but because they have a type of fear. If we're capable of addressing that fear, thanks to my knowledge, we're capable of reaching an agreement that is mutually beneficial to both me and them. And so, you know, to summarize it, emotional intelligence is something that I have built knowledge on. Fascinating stuff. I'm going to go look that up later and figure out all that stuff. That sounds fascinating. Alec, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it was fascinating to talk to you a uh, whole different direction, really, than we've had from some of the other speakers. What what a great value uh, you brought to us. Thank you for that. We, we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Grant, and thanks to the audience. If they have any questions, you know, I will be watching on Instagram. You can ask them down there, and I will make sure to answer every single one of you. Once again, thank you for your attention. Bye. Thanks again, Alan. Well, in case you've missed the announcement earlier during the conference, all the attendees are eligible to claim a copy of a financial trading course. Now, the course is usually $100, and you're going to get it for a symbolic $1 price. So please follow the detailed instructions on how to claim your course in the description. And now that we have all had our speakers share valuable information on personal finance, investment, what great insights we had today, we hope you found what you heard valuable and are inspired to develop better money, saving, and investing habits. And in order to have a say in what topics we should focus on more in the future, please check out the University Speakers Instagram page. And we'll post that link for you also. And the handle at University Speakers, at University Speakers. And like one or more of the last three posts, which are some 
potential topics which we're considering for the next conferences. So give us some feedback. We'd like, we'd really appreciate that. We strive to give as much value as possible to conference attendees and look forward to seeing you at future's events. And by the way, tell a friend too, why not, right? If you wanna receive invites to more conferences like the one today, please leave any feedback or review about your thoughts on today's conference by sending an email to conference at universityspeakers.org. That's conference at universityspeakers.org, which is the same email address you send the screenshots to enter that monthly $1,000 scholarship draw. Don't forget about that, right? Thank you for being here today. Hope you show up at our next conference. Hope to see you again. We wish you a great rest of your day. Thanks much.